I don't know the device, so I don't know what's in it and what's not in it. Uh, I can only speak of generalities. And the one thing I can say unequivocally without any concern is that it's not a nuclear phenomenon. With this process, there is a considerable release of energy, and we have demonstrated that this could be sustained on its own. To make matters worse, many skeptics look upon the Patterson cell with a queasy feeling of deja vu. A couple of scientists have come up with a discovery which someday could change the world. It is that significant. The reason everyone gets so excited about the prospect of low temperature fusion is that if you can really create it in a jar, the world would have a limitless supply of clean, cheap energy. In 1989, at the University of Utah, Stanley Pons and Martin Fleischmann claimed to have invented an amazing cold fusion device, as powerful as the sun, yet portable as a test tube. Like Patterson's device, theirs supposedly produced huge amounts of heat simply by passing a little bit of electricity through an electrode immersed in salt water. At first, Pons and Fleischmann were hailed as scientific heroes, but errors in their data surfaced, and other scientists had a hard time duplicating their experiment. The scientific evidence presented does not support that claim. Pons and Fleischmann were discredited and hounded out of the country. Today, in the south of France, they're working in a lavish new lab funded by the Japanese. They still claim to be producing energy, but many scientists in this country see them as failures, and their cold fusion device as a fiasco. In view of that history, it's very hard for reputable scientists to put aside what they are doing and suddenly become interested in a new set of claims. We need to change the impedance of the device so the component values are more reasonable. And then... One reputable exception is nuclear physicist George Miley, director of the Fusion Studies Lab at the University of Illinois. With Patterson's help and support, he's made his own Patterson cell from scratch. We've consistently measured a uh, excess energy coming out of it. It always puts out more energy than it takes in? Yes. Does that surprise you? Absolutely. That's, that's why we're so uh, excited about trying to understand what's going on. These Patterson cells seem to be unique and somewhat amazing in the in their reproducibility. At the University of Missouri, engineering professor Quentin Bowles has also been testing the cells with funding from Kansas City Power and Light, a major utility. He's received no funding from Patterson. We have in fact had a total of three cells uh, at different stages over the last nine months and um, it's fair to say that all three of them appear to be producing excess power. Both Bowles and Miley are now in the process of double and triple checking their results before publishing them in a scientific journal. They're being extra cautious, neither of them having forgotten the lesson of Pons and Fleischmann. I try to do the best work I can, honest work scientifically, and uh, uh, I'm very curious, so uh, I feel I would never be able to sleep with myself at night if I didn't uh, go ahead and look into it. It works and we don't know why. I don't know. That's my bottom line. So could this be the answer to modern society's prayer for a perfect energy source? Well, it depends whether it can be further verified, scaled up, and mass produced. Already, says Patterson, Motorola has tested his cells and offered to buy him out. In the meantime, think of yourself as witnessing the unraveling of an intriguing scientific mystery, one whose ending might leave us disappointed yet again or change our lives forever. All right, come on, hold on for him, Jim. You got him. Big fish, big fish. Some people will tend to take me with a grain of salt, but then I, I really don't care uh, what people think. I'm having fun. Now, I don't need the money. Uh, I don't need the aggravation, I don't need this, but I'm having fun. For Nightline, I'm Michael Gillen in Washington. That's a good one. And when we come back, a conversation we recorded earlier with two scientists who studied cold fusion. One a skeptic, one who sees the theoretical possibility.